Hello and welcome to the show. This is episode 289 of Stand Up. And joining me today, two of my closest friends in comedy, both Joe Matarese and Christian Finnegan. I'm your host, Pete Dominic. It's time to stand up with me right now. Hey guys, wow, another week in the books of life. And for those of you that spent time with me here on the podcast or last night at our Zoom hangout for Stand Up community members, thank you. Thank you very much for joining me. Always great to be along the ride with you and loved hanging out with uh, almost, I think it was about 50 of us were hanging out on the regular Thursday night Zoom. It starts at 8 East every Thursday. No special guests last night, and it was a but it was a fun group, and we talked about all kinds of different news related stuff, uh, and then I gossiped a bit, and people were just firing all kinds of random questions, and as always, we had a lot of laughs and danced together at the end, and I'd love to have you there. So if you're not already supporting the podcast with a paid subscription, then please sign up now. Go to patreoncom Dominic or just go to the paid subscription link in the show notes, and you can join us in the Zoom. And there's all kinds of other benefits. Twenty four seven, there's a chat happening on the discord platform you can go into different rooms and breakouts it's a great community and i would love to have you be a part of it in addition to listening to the podcast i've got a lot to play and discuss for you today i'm real happy with my conversations with both joe matteris and christian finnegan christian joins me pretty much every week and we go back over the week in terms of news and cultural stories and christian and i Had a great conversation today. That'll be first. And then I'm very excited for you to have uh, to hear Joe Matarese on the podcast. Joe is one of my oldest friends in comedy and one of my closest friends because uh, he and I have remained friends over the years because our wives became so close. He has two kids. I have two kids. We we spend a lot of time uh, as families together. And Joe and I had a great conversation about his own maturity and growth as a man as a as a father as a husband he talked about therapy he talked about his childhood and he talked about the the different meds that he's tried and i just love to watch him make an effort to make his life better and he's been a great inspiration for me to be curious about that myself and uh, it was just uh, such a heartfelt genuine conversation that i so hope you will listen to coming up later but first i've got to recap yesterday that's what i do at the beginning of every day's podcast and yes this podcast does come out every day and i recap whatever happened the day before in sound and news and commentary and of course yesterday was day three of the impeachment trial the second impeachment trial of president trump and the prosecution rested but not before making continuing to make a very strong case that all of the people that were covered in trump clothes and carrying trump flags and screaming trump sent us we're doing this for trump were actually doing it for trump that's the case that they had to make that all those people that went to the Capitol went to D.C. that that flew in, that bust in, that came from all over the country. For the big lie that he had been telling them that they came for him and that they sacked the Capitol for him. That's the case they had to make. It's never been a hard case because we all watched it and they, the jury, were actually witnesses to it. And yet and yet Republicans in the Senate still are a extremely unlikely and nobody thinks that there will be enough senators in the Republican Senate to vote to convict Donald Trump. So here we are and I've got a few things to play for you, but let's start with the uh, guys screaming. We're here for Donald Trump. Donald Trump said this. I heard this audio yesterday and (laughs) it's just like, if it wasn't so blood curdling, upsetting, it would be funny. Listen to this idiot. That was sound that was played during the hearing yesterday, just to make clear in case anybody was confused uh, why those people were there committing uh, those crimes, federal crimes, because they were invited by the president of the United States. Is what he was screaming in case you didn't hear it. 
Lead impeachment manager Jamie Raskin had yet another excellent performance. He made the case that Donald Trump is no stranger to inciting violence from his career as an entertainer to on the campaign trail at his rallies when he would tell his people to beat people up. Uh, of course, sharing that video of uh, of a whole bunch of his supporters surrounding Biden campaign folks on the Biden bus and then uh, also supporting the, the violence at the state capitals like the state capital of Michigan and telling them to liberate liberate the state. And of course, what we saw he promoted for weeks and lied about for months at the rally in Washington, D.C. Here's Jamie Raskin. January 6th was a culmination of the president's actions, not an aberration from them. The insurrection was the most violent and dangerous episode so far in Donald Trump's continuing pattern and practice of inciting violence. Here's Congressman and impeachment manager and lawyer Ted Lieu making the case that even Republicans, supporters of the president and his own chief of staff said that Donald Trump had incited in this and was wrong for it. You'll also hear, I think, Chris Christie, Adam Kinzinger, as well as Kevin McCarthy and Congressman Mike Gallagher, all Republicans. Longstanding Republicans also made clear that President Trump incited this insurrection and it went against our democracy. The president's former Secretary of Defense, James Mattis, declared that today's violent assault on our capital and effort to subjugate American democracy by mob rule was fomented by Mr. Trump. Former White House Chief of Staff John Kelly also spoke on this as well, and I'd like to play an audio clip of what he said. What happened on Capitol Hill yesterday is a direct result of his you know, poisoning the minds of people with the lies and the, and the frauds. I could not be fatter or more disappointed with the way our country looks at this very moment. People are getting hurt. Anyone involved in this, if you're hearing me, hearing very loud and clear, this is not the American way. Mr. President, you have got to stop this. You are the only person who can call this off. Call it off. Pretty simple. Um, the president um, caused this protest to occur. He's the only one who can make it stop. What the president said is not good enough. The president has to come out and, and tell his supporters to leave the Capitol grounds and to allow the Congress to do their business peacefully. And anything short of that is an abrogation of his responsibility. You know, a guy that knows how to how to tweet very aggressively on Twitter, you know, puts out one of the weakest statements and one of the saddest days in American history. So that was uh, quite a case being made by Republicans on what Trump should have done that day and what he was responsible for. Let's go back to Democrat Joe Nagusa, who has uh, been a superstar all week, who had a pretty apt analogy with what happened on January 6th. Standing in the middle of that explosive situation, in that powder keg that he had created over the course of months, before a crowd filled with people that were poised for violence, at his signal, he struck a match. And he aimed it straight at this building, at us. Well done, Joe Nagus. Let me go back uh, one more time to Jamie Raskin, who made another, you know, so many great points. But he also made this point. It's, it, it's not only the risk that uh, that that we don't hold him accountable, of course, for inciting an insurrection. The real concern is that he could do it again. What makes you think the nightmare with Donald Trump and his lawmaking and violent mobs is over? If we let him get away with it. And then it comes to your state capital, or it comes back here again, what are we going to say? These prior acts of incitement cast a harsh light on Trump's obvious intent. Obvious intent. His unavoidable knowledge of the consequences of his incitement. The unavoidable knowledge of the consequences of his incitement and the clear foreseeability of the violent harm that he unleashed on our people and our republic. And finally, this 
Trump knew exactly what he was doing in inciting the January 6th mob. Exactly. He had just seen how easily his words and actions inspired violence in Michigan. He sent a clear message to his supporters. He encouraged planning and conspiracies to take over Capitol buildings and threaten public officials who refused to bow down to his political will. All right. And last night on MSNBC, Chris Hayes had uh, lawyer, Democratic uh, lawyer Mark Elias, who was the, the lead lawyer for the DNC fighting all these stupid, frivolous lawsuits uh, and recounts and questions about fraud and so on. And he won them all. He's a brilliant guy and deserves all the credit. So he was previewing what we were going to expect from Trump's defense and his shitty lawyers. And, you know, they're going to try to say it's unconstitutional. But, of course, the Senate voted that it was constitutional so they can say it. But it's already been it's over. It's been decided. Um, then there's going to be the kind of what about ism, of course, where they're going to talk about uh, certain comments that Democrats have made in the past uh, inciting violence, according to them. I mean, of course, never when the Democrats never said go attack the state capitol. I mean, it's just preposterous, but they'll make those what about isms, of course. Uh, but. Chris Hayes said to Mark Elias, then, you know, all the all, the, all he has is a very thin defense of that he didn't know and kind of playing dumb. And Mark Elias had this to say about that. Yeah, look, I don't think it's that plausible, though. Right. He well, did know. <laughs> Donald Trump knew exactly what he was doing. Right. Donald Trump was getting exactly what he wants. And we focused a lot in the last week on the lies that he propagated about um, the whether there was fraud in the election and court after court found there wasn't. But there was a big huge lie at the end, which was that somehow he, Donald Trump, was going to prevent the certification of the election in the Congress because Mike Pence was going to do some magical uh, war dance and not certify. And that lie led to the death of individuals on January 6th. And so he can say they can say whatever they want, but that is just the cold truth. All right. And now I wanted to play for you uh, uh, this asshole, Frank Luntz. He's a Republican pollster who I don't like at all, but he's really good at his job. And he was holding a focus group to analyze the reactions of people viewing the in the Donald Trump's impeachment trial. And he, he predicted that all the although the former former president will most certainly be acquitted, his reputation won't be. And here he uh, here is that. Well, the intensity is clearly on Donald Trump's side, and we've found this every day since Election Day itself. The Trump people will be heard. They will not be silenced. They've got a point of view, and they're going to express it as loudly as they can. But make no mistake, this is not changing public opinion. The video did shock people. It did silence people. I was I was amazed at how quiet those people who you just saw yelling weren't yelling after they watched the 13-minute video. They were really humble. The fact is they're not going to get the votes. It's not going to change the outcome of, of this uh, of this trial, but it's going to have an impact for Donald Trump and his reputation forever. Wow. Frank Luntz. And does anybody disagree with him? I mean, the insurrection was the thing. The next day they was it the next day they banned him from Twitter and that was it. <laughs> he doesn't get the final word and history gets written. And I hope the Frank Luntz is right. All right, let me uh, give you one more clip here. And this is, of course, my friend John Avalon uh, at CNN joins me regularly here on the show. And he does these great reality checks. And uh, I-, I love this one from John. You got to follow him on Twitter at John Avalon. In this reality check, John looks at the violent, how violent rhetoric about storming the U.S. Capitol and harming politicians was posted online in the days leading up to the insurrection. We don't have to guess what motivated the mob. We can see how incitement led to this insurrection. We all saw Donald Trump spread the big lie, but now we can see how his followers internal, internalized and amplified his message, twisting patriotism into pure hate. And this was not well hidden. Calls to violence were evident for weeks on the forums that Trump White House closely monitored. One meme posted on the Donald promoted the January 6th rally by saying the Capitol is our goal. Every corrupt member of Congress locked in one room and surrounded by real Americans is an opportunity that will never present itself again. Another post said if Congress illegally certifies Biden, Trump would have absolutely no choice but to demand us to storm Congress and kill slash beat them up for it. Well, a thread on a message board said, 
Congress needs to hear glass breaking, doors being kicked in. Stop calling this a march or a rally or a protest. Go there ready for war. We get our president or we die. Now, that was cited in an internal FBI report, which issued an explicit warning that extremists were preparing to travel to Washington and commit violence and war. And that is contrary to Trump administration claims they had no indication that this rally could turn violent. But there were public reports as well, warning that online forums were erupting with violent threats. It turns out that Trump's hardcore supporters took him seriously and literally. Because many of them showed up at the rally wearing tactical gear, ready to storm the Capitol. Some even had murder on their mind. Multiple indictments now detail possible intent to kill Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Alleged calls to shoot her in the friggin' brain from one Pennsylvania woman. While a lawyer from Georgia posted about his incursion into her office, writing, Crazy Nancy probably would have been torn into little pieces. But perhaps the clearest cause and effect was directed at Trump's loyal Vice President Mike Pence. So where did they get this idea that he was a traitor? Well, Trump mentioned Pence 11 times in his rally speech, telling him to be strong and break the law. But once rioters broke into the Capitol, with Pence and his family pulled off the floor by Secret Service, Trump tweeted again, essentially calling Pence a coward for doing his constitutional duty. Trump's tweet was then read aloud by a rioter outside. Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country. And calls of hang Mike Pence started cascading through the crowd. Now, if the mob could turn on Mike Pence, why would any Republican senator think they would be spared? Gollum always turns on its creator. More than a dozen rioters now say Trump incited them to insurrection, with one suspect's lawyer calling Trump a cult leader. Republicans could learn from this belated revelation, because if they can't find moral clarity in the evidence that's been presented, they will be tying their legacies to this disgraced former president, his attack on the election and the attack on the Capitol. And that's your reality check. And that's your reality check. I'd say it with that kind of confidence as well. If I put in as much as much work and research into those three minute reality checks, they take hours. I know to put them together. Great job, John. Okay. well, uh, there is a lot more to tell you. Okay, one more thing. I got to just play uh, about vaccines and covid uh president biden said today that we're on track to have vaccines for 300 million americans by the end of july here's that just this afternoon we signed the final contracts for 100 million more moderna and 100 million more pfizer vaccines we're also able to move up the delivery dates with an additional 200 million vaccines to the end of july faster than we expected And in further good news, both companies agreed and we're now contractually obligated to 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 expedite delivery of 100 million doses that were promised by the end of to deliver them by the end of May. That's a month faster. That means lives will be saved. That means we're now on track to have enough supply for 300 million Americans by the end of July. So I think that is great, great news and really glad to hear that lots of folks last night and our uh, hangout were talking about that they'd gotten the vaccine uh, were getting their second shot. So really happy if that is you. And I'm not sure where I categorize in line. Healthy 45 year old guy doesn't leave his shed. I'm not sure when that guy gets his vaccine, but I'll wait my turn. Oh, wait, what's that sound? Oh, you know, that can only mean... Rather hear other stories like prices at the pump. Well, sit back, because here comes today's news dump. (laughs) Damn McDonald again. Thank you. Keep them coming, buddy. Who else? Who can can knock off the reigning champion of news dump jingles? Send them to me at standupwithpete at gmail.com. Okay, the news dump. Let's start with... The sad news that jazz fusion pioneer Chick Corea has died of cancer at the age of 79. This guy apparently was one of the most revered uh, musicians in all of contemporary jazz whose work spanned 
from classical to fusion, and he was a keyboardist, composer, band leader, prolific in every sense. Korea released well over 100 albums and maintained a very busy touring schedule. The social media announcement of his death included words from Korea himself, who said, I want to thank all of those along my journey who have helped keep the music fires burning bright. It is my hope that those who have an inkling to play, write, perform, or otherwise do so. If not for yourself, then for the rest of us. It's not only that the world needs more artists, but also just a lot of fun. Love it. Chick Corea. Uh, and shares of the company Bumble reached to $72 on Thursday afternoon in the company's market debut. And they made the chief executive uh, very, very wealthy. Her name is Whitney Wolf, and she's only 31. She's now the youngest female founder to take a company public, according to CNBC. And her shares are apparently worth $1.5 billion. I'll, I'll never understand how this is fucking possible. The Bloomberg Index showed that the world's 500 richest people gained $1.8 trillion in wealth last year, 91% of which went to men. Less than 5% of the world's 500 largest fortunes are held by self-made women like Whitney Wolf Heard. So what is Bumble again? It's a dating app, and she used to work at a, another one called Tinder. I can't keep up track with any of these. She filed and later settled settled a sexual harassment lawsuit saying that Tinder executives called her derogatory names and took away her co-founder role. And, uh, wow, how about that? She went on to create her own new dating app, and uh, good for her. I am not going to read much more about it right now. Uh, speaking of uh, successful women or uh, women to respect... U.S. and Canadian authorities are celebrating the release of a Saudi women's rights activist after over a thousand days in prison. Though allies say she's not free yet. Lujan al Hathloul, 31-year-old activist who attended university in Canada, was arrested in 2014 as she defied a ban on women driving. She continued to fight for women's rights, including removal of male guardianship laws in Saudi Arabia. And she was detained again in May 2018. She said she endured torture and sexual abuse before facing trial in December. Her family's confirmed that she's released earlier than expected, sharing a photo of her smiling, according to the Associated Press. So apparently the Saudi activist's uh, release is seen as a nod to Joe Biden. Hmm, that's good news. At least five people are dead in a massive crash pileup in near Fort Worth, Texas, on a uh, icy highway. About 100 vehicles were involved. And uh, this is all reporting from the Fort Worth Star Telegram. The toll could grow. Authorities were searching vehicle by vehicle for trapped drivers and passengers, and several of the approximately three dozen people transported to hospitals had critical injuries. Yikes. Instagram has banned Robert F. Kennedy Jr. How about that? His vaccine posts have got him booted off of Instagram. Instagram says we removed this account for repeatedly sharing debunked claims about the coronavirus or vaccines, according to a spokeswoman for the social media's parent company, Facebook, in a statement to CNN. Bye-bye, RFK Jr. You guys stop that nonsense. Even his family's begging him to do that. What a weird dude on that one. And how about this Bloomberg reporting? U.S. home prices were fueled by the lowest mortgage rates in history. Surge in the fourth quarter. U.S. home prices post 14.9% jump in a pandemic real estate rally for the fourth quarter. The median price of a single family home climbed 14.9% to $315,000 compared with a year earlier, according to the National Association of Realtors. And finally, here is the headline at CNN. Pigs can be taught how to use joysticks, according to a new experiment. The intelligence of pigs has long been renowned, and scientists in the U.S. have now found that they are clever enough to be able to use computer joysticks. Researchers at Purdue University in Indiana said they were able to train four pigs to carry out a joystick-operated video game task to get treats. Pig success rate in the test was described by researchers as, quote, remarkable and indicative of their behavior and cognitive flexibility. Stop eating pigs and start getting them as pets. How about that idea? No? All right. That is your news dump for Friday, the 12th of February. Thank you very much for joining me on it. And I want to tell you before I get to... I've got uh, Joe Matarese and Christian Finnegan joining me, but just want to take a second to 
Thank you. You may know that for the past couple of months, uh, this podcast has had its first and only sponsor, my favorite nonprofit, one of my favorite nonprofits for sure, GiveWell. And by now you all know that they are this amazing organization that searches for the global charities that save and improve lives the most per dollar so that donors like you can do the most good possible with your donations, your generous donations. And so GiveWell wanted to do something a bit different. They actually wanted to simply say thank you to you stand-up listeners because since mid-November, when this campaign started, the stand-up audience donated over $15,000 to highly effective charities that GiveWell recommends. GiveWell is estimating that this is enough money to help thousands of people prevent many from becoming sick and save the lives of three to six children. We save the lives. You save the lives of three to six children and helped thousands of others. And more broadly, podcast listeners over $1.5 million gave over $1.5 million in 2020 Enough money to save hundreds from diseases that are deadly, but that can be treated or prevented with cheap and proven methods as long as they have funding. GiveWell and their research team only make a difference when people like you act. And from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. These are incredible outcomes made possible because people like you recognize the needs of others, others who live far from your homes that you'll never meet, but you decided to help. And for me, it's been really special because it's been just over a year now that I left Sirius XM broken and terrified about what was next and worked harder than I've ever worked my entire life at the age of 44, now 45, to build this podcast and with it, this amazing, generous community who did that. We raised $15,000 over that and saved three to six lives. And there's just nothing in my career or in my life that I could be more proud of, of, of creating this podcast and rising from the ashes. And I couldn't have done it without you. So thank you so much for your donations to give well. I really appreciate it. They really appreciate it. And if you want to help in 2021, give well is encouraging you to keep the giving spirit alive with a recurring donation. Any listener who starts a, a new monthly donation by the end of February will have their first month matched by $250. So your monthly donation automatically works towards saving these lives, preventing deadly disease and helping those in extreme poverty. Go to givewell.org slash stand up select podcast and the uh, stand up with pete dominic at checkout givewell.org slash stand up thank you guys so much now it's time to get to my first guest for today's show he joins me pretty much every friday to recap the week and news and so much to talk about this week with christian finnegan and then coming up i hope you won't miss my conversation with joe matteris after this Check out Christian on Twitter at Christ Finnegan. Buy all of his albums. See him perform live. The great Christian Finnegan right now. Did you watch the Super Bowl? Passively. Hello, Peter. Hi. Uh, I, it was on. <laughs> Did do you have things to say about the halftime performance, the weekend? Oh, about, about the weekend? I yeah, listened to that not, song, uh, Save Your Tears, like all week. I love that song. I guess. I don't know. But why does he go more like the long weekend? Uh, but the, why did huh? he? No. <laughs> why did he um, act like Michael Jackson and get plastic surgery to look like Michael Jackson? I don't know anything, but it seems uh, that that's the case. I don't know. I, you know, I I, I I understand he's he he writes okay songs. He's not he's not like untalented. Right. I just don't get the giant appeal, and I think that he's the kind of guy who's just like. Give me millions of dollars and I'll do crazy weird things, but they're not actually that weird. And the songs aren't really that great. I don't, he, he's a guy who acts like he's like a rock and roll hall of famer. And he's just, not. <laughs> hey, I, never, I, I think I said on, on, on thing I said on Twitter that he reminds me of a kid performing at the high school talent show, but the high school is a private school where three of the buildings are named after his grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I didn't know anything about him. Never heard of him. I don't know anything about music. Obviously I don't pay much attention to it unless I'm reading your Twitter feed and just, just you, all, all your musical, all my, yeah, whatever my you say, feed. whatever I just go, I agree with everything you say about everything. Well, I appreciate Even that. Even if I don't Somebody's know got to. what you're talking about. Also, if you didn't like somebody, 
and I didn't know who they were, I wouldn't like them. That's well, how much. That is uh, weird. Uh, no. <laughs> I'm that. I give away all of my trust to people who's kind of who I know well and whose judgment I respect. I'm like, I don't want to do the work. If he says he's a dick, he's a dick. That's it. Yeah, I don't even know if he's a dick. <laughs> no, I'm not saying know. that. Just, You're saying that about like this him. guy. I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan. I'm not if, a fan of if, the if, weakened. If, if you said that, though, if you just told me mm-hmm. anything, you would tell me. I mean, that's kind of, I think, the respect I have afforded for you. I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever mm-hmm. Christian says, that guy's. But also, it's true of art, too. If you said something oh, about music. Or, scene? Fuck that guy, right, Pete? Well, no, I was joking. I was going to ask you about that. I mean, do you think he was drunk during the Jeep filming ad no. as well? <laughs> well, uh, the story Doesn't I actually just about an hour t- ago read what the story was, and it's so fucking dumb. He was apparently riding on his motorcycle and pulled over to sign some autographs for some like people that were on the side of the road. Somebody had a bottle of tequila or in, whatever, and he did a shot of tequila while sitting on his bike, but not moving, just sitting on his bike, and mm-hmm. he took a shot. It's like, hey, do a shot do a shot and then the police saw this whole thing happening and the minute he pulled out on his bike they pulled him over and he blew a, a point uh oh two which is one quarter of the legal limit not that i have the legal limit memorized but that's just what i read so he wasn't uh, driving erratically or dangerously no apparently i mean i think the car may have been or his bike might have been idling that's so surprising but, to me because i would think that if a superstar gets pulled over especially in new jersey and it's and it's Springs in the cop. I don't care if, if he's fall down drunk. Cops like, come on, we'll drive you home, Bruce. Like it's yeah, Bruce I don't know because he, he wrote that anti uh, police brutality song a few years back. Maybe they haven't forgiven him for that right. uh, Abner Luima song that he wrote. Oh, right. somebody else said that too. His politics aren't exactly in line with uh, with law enforcement. But he's Bruce Springsteen. Who's pulling him over and giving him a ticket? He's seventy one too. Uh, what did you think of that commercial? The Jeep commercial that brought us Dumb, all together in front of a not a fan candidate. Christian Love church. Bruce. I, I give him a pass. He's 71. Right. I understand, but I, I've kind of, I feel like over the past few years, especially he's been so much cooler than I would have imagined that to see him kind of slip back into like, Hey, we all got to find common ground. Like it's just, come <laughs> on, man. Right now, right now we had find common ground. Yeah. Like, you know, during the, you know, while I, uh, the Capitol was just, you know, uh, invaded by rioters and people believe that Democrats are crushing baby skulls to scoop the delicious chemicals out of their brains. You know, like <laughs> I have to find common ground. So what's the common ground with something like that? It's like, okay, well, let's say Democrats just molest babies. They don't murder them for their, uh, for their delicious chemicals, but they do molest them. Is that common well, ground? Well, I, I think you're being a little bit too harsh. Like if I hear that kind of, you know, crazy conspiracy theory, I'm like, where are you on renewable energy? <laughs> so, yeah, so, so yeah, you got, you're right. Good point. Good where point. are you on guns? <laughs> I get the feeling that we pretty much know <laughs> yeah. it is weird how these things just all go together. That it's like, uh, like you very rarely meet somebody who's like, yes, I believe the Democrats are molesting children in the basement of a pizza parlor and, uh, Jews set fires with space lasers. And also the Keystone pipeline must go forward. <laughs> what do you think? Like, that's what a what- weird <laughs> set of issues that is. <laughs> I think that's about, there's a certain certain thread of kind of like authoritarianism, individualism, masculinity, even for women, you know, this kind of don't tell me what to do uh, yes. attitude that, that all falls in line with with those types of issues. But that doesn't explain why they're anti, I don't know, vaccine or. Yeah, raising taxes I, you know, on the rich or something. There's that just strange bedfellows, you know, that, that there's a party line. And I feel like once you subscribe to. Once you've decided who your team is, you end up adopting the positions of your team. Yeah. But you don't you always know? know the positions of your team on some of the more complex issues. And yet they well, still. That's the, thing. that's the problem with a lot of these people. So they're like, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not a sheep. Like I do my own, do your own research. Like, oh, really? So you did your own research and you just happen to fall in line with every other person who <laughs> is in your sort of tribe. Interesting how you did your own research and you all magically came to the same idiotic conclusions about 50 different issues. You know what? I don't do a lot. My own research. I just go to people who do the research for a living. And I'm like, okay, yeah. you probably know what you're talking about. If you, it, well, it, and what, when people are like, Oh, you just follow the mainstream media, you should do your own research. It's like, 
I'm Googling just like you are, asshole. Like what, what, what <laughs> research? All right. So you're going to the, the library and you have like a, like a <laughs> lamp on, you're burning the midnight oil at two in the morning. You're surrounded well, by books and going through the, the card catalog. <laughs> I'm like, no, you're not. You're just fucking All clicking on up. links in your f- Twitter feed. Well, and, they're not uh, doing, stupid the, that's the thing that irks the shit on me. No one's doing any research unless you're a researcher. Like if we're talking yeah. about science or COVID or, or climate or anything, medicine of any kind. It's like, you're not doing any research. And by the way, everybody knows that you're always going to find whatever you want when it comes to these issues. If you can have cancer, AIDS, and Parkinson's together, if you want, just do the research. Internet will take you there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look hard enough, you will find out that the cure for the coronavirus is Skittles. I mean, you don't. That's right. If you keep searching for long enough to top hit, as a matter of fact, you will find something that it's will back Skittles up that ad. Skittles ad. Okay, taste uh, the rainbow as a way to segue. Unless out of- you lost your sense of taste. <laughs> 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 taste the rainbow. Well, you probably won't be able to taste anything. Actually, let's be honest, because you've but got trust COVID. us. The rainbow's there. <laughs> trust us. <it's> there. <laughs> uh, a candy you cannot do without. Oh, boy. Um, I would say depends. I vacillate between juji fruits and milk duds. Those are my two go tos. I know they're weird. <laughs> oh wow! What are you eighty? Juji fruit. Because well, they have those in the in the movie store boxes. Like, Why do you, you hate your teeth? Stuff. Like not move, not movie store. You know you, the movie theater size yeah. boxes. Like when you go to oh uh, my god, Juji fruits. People are shocked right now here and there. I know Juji fruits are not popular. Attack are, him on Twitter. Like Juji bees? No, I mean Juji fruits. J U J Y fruits. I like Juji lasers. Uh, let's talk about. <laughs> Uh, this country Juju music, lasers. Country sorry, music star uh, who said the N word and got canceled. And also a lot of people got canceled. <laughs> we, uh, the New York I Times like guy got canceled. Stop using the word, even in yeah, a sort know, of shorthand know, mocking way. A lot of cancellations this week. Do, uh, the New York Times guy, uh, the, the country music guy, and then the, the actress uh, from the Mandalorian canceled. They're all canceled. What's I'm happening? Not... I'm so upset. I don't care. I don't understand the, the the Mandalorian woman Gina Carano. I believe her name is. They like, should have they should have fired her for um, um terrible acting. There you go. Really now bad. Talking. Like not trying to act at all. Well, it's funny because she was in a, a few years ago. She was like a, a, an ultimate fighter, like yeah. a, a mixed martial yeah. artist. And she's apparently and, the only actress that can fight in the world, apparently. Yeah. Well, she was in this Steven Soderbergh movie that came like Steven Soderbergh kind of plucked her out of nowhere and uh, made a movie called Haywire with her in it, which is surprisingly good. Hmm. And she, her acting is kind of stiff, but better than you would think a mixed martial artist's acting would be. And so I feel like people got a little snookered by that. It's kind of like when you meet the musician who's kind of funny and you're like, Oh my God, this guy's hilarious. Like John Mayer. You're like, no, he's a normal person. Who's an average sense of humor, but we're just, <laughs> yeah. you know, or like the, the Chrissy Teigen, like she's hilarious. Yeah. Is yeah. she, is she really undo she? credit? You're just so surprised <laughs> that they are blank. That yeah, they, you yeah. give them a, a and so I mean, like Gina Carano. It's like, Oh, well she's, she's like the, the mixed martial artist who can act. Yeah. And then you see her around actual actors and you're like, Oh, maybe not. The truth is, each one of these cases that, you know, when when things these types of things happen are are different. They need to be taken on a case by case basis. But did you pay attention to any of the three of those? And, and what do you think about maybe the country music star guy? And by the way, the, the whole idea of him being canceled. Yeah, is apparently is maybe his record label dropped him. They stopped playing him on the radio. He sold more albums after he said the N word than any time before. And one of the guys apparently who wrote some of his music uh donated all the profits from the new album sales to the local chapter of the NAACP, which I thought was, uh, yeah, was worth Isle. it. Find uh, me an NAACP that doesn't think it's worth it to get a huge influx of money just because some white guy said the N-word. <laughs> I mean, yeah, fine. It was, J- J- it was fine. Jason Isbell who wrote a song called Cover Me Up, uh, which is uh, a great song. And uh, Morgan Wallen, which is the country star's uh, name, uh, did a cover of it. And so he said he's been getting a cut Jason Got Ismail it. said he's been getting money because of the cover on the album. Uh, so he was donating that to end the uh, I don't know why I needed to fill in the Wikipedia entry for that particular news item, but there it was. Um, you know, I guess 
I guess my feeling is that it's kind of refreshing on some level to see kind of just the immediate, Hey, we're not going to just sit by and laugh this crap off anymore. I mean, cause you could tell, did you see the video? Yeah. Did you watch the yeah, video? Yeah. I mean, you could tell like, this is not this dude's first time throwing that word around, you know, and it, it, it rolled off his tongue way too But he easily. said it as a term of endearment, take care of this N word, take care yeah, of it. But- I don't know. It, it, it just, it sounded very comfortable coming out of his mouth. <laughs> and I don't think it's because he hangs around a lot of black people. No? I don't think he has the, uh, the, the hall pass or whatever, whatever no. the term is, the ghetto pass. I don't think pass, really anybody does anymore. If anybody ever had it, they've lost it. Yeah. Pretty much. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. It, it, it doesn't surprise me that it would garner this dude, some credibility among the, you know, not only the country fans who still <laughs> love the idea that somebody's saying that word, but also the, the anti cancel culture people, whatever, go ahead. But I, I can just say that I'm glad the people who work in the industry, the people who work at the record labels, the people who work at, you know, the management companies, the publicist offices, I, I'm kind of happy to see them say, you know what, I, this isn't worth it. I don't want to, I don't want to, This isn't the world that I want to perpetuate. This isn't, I I feel like country music has a a chance to be something different and better than it is. And we're going to speak up and we're not going to work with this guy anymore. And, you know, nobody's throwing this guy in jail. It's just people have made the business decision that they don't want to work with him. You know, and this is the same guy who got, you know, booted off of SNL a couple months ago because he, was making out with chicks at a bar two days before he did SNL, you know, and that's bad. I, I'm sure we'll have a net positive effect on his career. Yeah. It'll be, yeah. it'll be a comeback story and yeah. he'll, it'll all be fine. But I don't, I, I've, I've been kind of impressed by the alacrity uh, with which certain people and certain companies and industries have just immediately said, no, enough. No, we're not working with this dude anymore. Enough. Um, did you watch, Impeachment hearings this week? Were you glued to the TV? I was glued to uh, the uh, Sirius radio, the MSNBC channel, or not even, or, you know, I did watch some of it on, on, uh, because we don't have cable here where I am, but I did, we do have CBS all access. So I was watching some of it on CBS and I will say it is really informative, um, depressing, but informative to watch the news on one of the big four channels you know an actual network news broadcast Why? because they're just weeks behind what people who are online are talking about that's you know, a really a very interesting thing that you're saying and and i'm not sure exactly what you mean but i think i do in terms of their what would you how, how would you depict it well they're how, just there's the the cliff notes version of what's going on and they're they're presenting things they're just spoon feeding the the basic bullet points of some of these stories like they were i think it was Kat, caroline herrera i think that's her name uh uh they were interviewing her uh last night i believe and she was like uh the fbi has taken interest in a group known as the oath keepers and was like, <laughs> yeah yeah no kidding yeah, really? Yeah, this is your reporting? <laughs> yeah, we were talking they about this were weeks Ruby ago. Ridge. <laughs> yes, I, this is not this is not a new thing. You know, it's like the Proud Boys. You know, and <laughs> and I, on the one hand, it does make you realize just how online you are. You know, that you're swimming in this crap. And I guess it's probably you know for people like my dad who would not have heard of the Oath Keepers right. unless I told him about it. Right. Um, I guess I understand why point. they do that, but it's my just, dad it is, is really an oath keeper. I'm sorry. My dad actually is an oath keeper. I didn't have to tell oh, him. Really? Yeah. He's been in for a while, a year now. He doesn't like, you know, he doesn't believe in the shit, but he likes the camaraderie. He likes the what? Camaraderie. Just oh yeah. Network. Just a, just a hang. Yeah. Just a hang. <laughs> um, my dad was, uh, before the pandemic, he had started a or joined a little men's group of old men in Lowell, Massachusetts, who would get together called the the uh, I think they were called the the Lowell Clippers. OK, like like an old man gang. All essentially, right. I like it. What were they, they doing? Just like 
and they would get together and just have coffee and talk and stuff. That's pretty, I see but, that a lot. I think it's super healthy and I think it's very common. Um, and I, and I, uh, the last time though, I said, I talked about it on the podcast, these two guys where it was shortly after the insurrection and they were plotting three guys, old guys in a deli and they were plot what they were going to do next. And I, I've talked about this before, but it took all of me to not go up to him and go, hey, you're not going to do anything. <laughs> you're not doing yeah. it. There's nothing that you're going to do or can do. You're old yeah. and you're fat and you can't even make they it. They were going to do like to, to join in or to oppose them. Don't know. Didn't get the whole yeah. plop. They're like, you'll see, we're planning something. I'm like, what are you planning? Yeah. Really? What you're are you planning? planning? You can't even like fix the cupboard door at home. Like you're, you're you old. can't even tie your shoes. No, like like exactly. that down that far yep. to tie your shoes. They, yeah. Anger only gets you just so far. But, uh, anyway, um, the, you're, you're saying that you're watching the networks and they were, they were far behind. I'm going to ask you though, you know, I was having a discussion with a friend of mine who I have a great deal of respect for. And he was, I, I've been talking about the performance. I've been just praising the Democrats. I think the impeachment managers have been absolutely excellent. I've been talking a lot about their performance Christian and I think that as comedians as performers we look at these things way differently and my friend was like that's just it you see it as a performance I'm like yeah uh, yes it's a performance so is a college professor lecturing so is a parent trying to communicate with in my case my teenage daughter and keep her engaged the whole thing to me as a comedian or an impeachment manager is keep this interesting so that people yes. will stay engaged. I've been critical of people, old people like Gerald Nadler and Nancy Pelosi and Nancy and, and Diane Feinstein and this artifact. I mean, I like him, but he's a fossil. Pat Leahy, who can barely you can barely hear him. You have to be able to communicate with passion, be able to articulate inflection, the rate at which you talk and obviously the content and uh, from all of them, every one of them has been, I think, exceptional at performing and communicating the, the, the evidence and the argument. That's my, my take on it, and I think it matters. What do you think? Well, I mean, I, I thought the same thing last time around. I mean, I thought Adam Schiff did an amazing job, too. I, I agree with everything you're saying, except I do think that they have made one tactical misstep in going on as long as they have, hmm. that there is a threshold that I think they may have crossed in terms of attention span, or there's uh, that there is a, well, there were just certain, certain things and certain clips and certain moments of that speech that have been replayed too many times, you know, and because I, I don't think it's from lack of coordination, but you know, if I've just seen David Cicilline, uh, play the part of Trump's speech where he talks about, you know, we're going to go down to the Capitol. You know, I, I don't need to hear Julian, uh, Joaquin Castro play that same part. And, you know, uh, Stacey Plaskett, I believe that's her name, um, uh, play that same part. You know, I, I don't need every single person to play the same five clips over and over again. Granted, I'm maybe watching more of it than the average person. So maybe the theory is, is that they're trying to catch new view. I mean, the whole the whole premise of it is so dumb because you, they have to act like they're trying to convince each other when they're really not. The Democrats are trying to convince the viewing audience to the extent that the Republicans feel the outrage and pressure coming from voters that they have to change their mind. You know what I mean? Yeah. But there's this weird you, artifice that they have to actually act like they're trying to, you know, Josh Hawley, listen to me. See, let me let me try to convince you to convict Donald Trump. Like, no, you know, I think that there's maybe five to eight people who are generally in play. And those people are going to be convinced or unconvinced, not by the facts, but just because of how much outrage and uproar uh, like some of this footage can provide, but I think it's important to do it anyway. I think it is, it is super important for there to be a, a historical document laid out in painstaking detail so that these people can never escape yeah. this vote. Um, I mean, to me, making the case that this was a cowardly vote of acquittal is going to be a lot clearer and a lot easier in future elections than the Ukraine impeachment. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, all great points. I think that the idea that anybody buying into the possibility that enough Republicans are going to vote to convict, I don't think anybody I know believes that. I don't, I don't think 
doesn't matter what. Yeah, doesn't mean it's not important. Doesn't mean it doesn't, have doesn't to be mean done. that they don't ha- yeah. absolutely have to do this. Uh, all right. Finally, I saw this tweet today from um, Washington Post reporter, who I think is one of the brightest. But I don't. I don't love how he worded it. I want to get your take on it. Phil Bump at P Bump. He tweets a remarkable finding in a new CBS poll. So he's just he's Washington Post reporter coming in a CBS poll. Most Republicans say that Democrats aren't political opponents, but instead enemies. And what I what I quoted that and I said, if you listen to right wing talk radio any time in the last 15 years, you would have known this. This is completely unsurprising to me. Having lived in the belly of the beast of, of, of talk radio and shared an office with the right wing guys at Sirius and listened to it a lot. Mark Levin, Hannity yeah. and the guys at Sirius. That's just how they talked. They talked about us as if we were their enemies. We were this. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, Phil, Phil Bump seems like a smart dude or whatever, but these guys, they've been drinking the Aaron Sorkin juice for too long. You know, this isn't what do you the mean? West Wing. You know, like they, they, they still, they act like that up until very recently, you know, Democrats and Republicans could reach across the table and, you know, you know, find common ground and just all this crap that hasn't been the case since Newt Gingrich. I mean, Newt Gingrich really was the sort of original sin. I know, granted, maybe somebody who's older might say, oh, actually, no, it started with person X or whatever. But since in my in my adulthood, Newt Gingrich was like the first guy to realize, oh, if we literally just demonize the other side and we can win a war of attrition by just being scummier than they are, by being uh, more disingenuous by being for acting in, in less good faith than the other side, that there is an electoral advantage to be had by doing that. And, you know, and, and that's a, a straight line that you can draw from, you know, Rush Limbaugh to uh, the Monica Lewinsky scandal to, uh, you know, anti-war, uh, the way they treated anti-war activists during the Iraq war yeah. to the birther movement, to, you know, it's the whole thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's the idea that there's been a principled Republican party, you know, and that's, I remember a couple of years ago, or right after AOC was elected, you know, she was saying, you know, they've been clowns for my entire adult life. Mm. You know, they, the younger people see it much more clearly. They've never been not clowns. In their, I in mean, their mind. there's a lot of different ways to, to to prove it. But if you just talk about the gun issue, they have as long as I've been living, they've saying been saying that Democrats are going to take away your guns. And and the, the next step is to get more guns, to be ready to fight them because they're your enemy. They're going to take your guns, take your freedom, take your liberty, all that stuff. They've been saying it forever, as long as I can remember. Yeah, I mean, and it, set aside the fact that it uh, whether that would be a morally defensible thing to do and i quite honestly go back and forth on that i mean part of me feels like all right how about this everybody gets a gun you can have a gun that's it i there's no i don't understand the the rationale that i need 50 guns like I, it, to me it's just pure fetishism it's it's all yeah. fetish yeah. but um but it's it's logistically impossible nobody's coming after your guns because there's more important things to do that's Jethro. the whole point it's not real. It's not happening. And yet they say it and, and they yeah. lather these people into, you know, being what well, I've said this to you before that, that everybody has this idea that like I have political uh, opinions and I act upon those political opinions. Whereas to me, it's always the opposite. I have certain things I want to do and I will create whatever belief system I need to believe in order to justify the things I want to do. You know, I want to murder you I, or I want to rub your face in the dirt and make you a second class citizen and you know, or whatever. But, and so therefore I will believe what I need to believe in order to justify. I mean, that's what Q is. That's what all these, that's what all this crap is. That's yeah. what I'm going to take your guns away. They're, they're going to take away your guns. It's like, I want to be able to have the bully uh, pulpit of owning fucking bazooka and having that sort of guns and ammo mindset that makes me feel like a big man when I walk into the fucking Walmart. And therefore I will create some bullshit defense of the second amendment in order to allow me to buy the stupid shit I want to buy. Well done. You ever shoot guns? I've been to a, uh, like a, a, uh, I shot like a, like a, a skeet shooting musket musket <laughs> uh, oh, shotgun wow. once. Like, you know, clay, you know, they fling the clay yeah, things yeah. in the air. Yeah, that's cool. That's, that's fun. Yeah, no, Cambry, Cambry really wants to get a gun, my wife. Uh, yeah. And I'm just like, first of all, we can't get a gun because one of us will kill me with it. <laughs> and uh, 
I'm sorry for <laughs> laughing at your suits. No, it's true. That's it's uh it's it's a line. Um but um also it's like, so who are we gonna buy this gun from? We're gonna go take fucking gun lessons from some second amendment piece of shit. Like I'm gonna have to actually learn from this guy and take oh yes, yeah. please tell me. You'll find oh, some yeah. common ground with him. You guys will love you both love Castle. Oh, I love your Gadsden flag, sir. <laughs> no. <laughs> I love your Gadsden flag. Where'd you get that? Where, where'd, where'd you get, get that flag? It? Just make it. Oh, you know, make a conversation. Trump store. <laughs> Trump I told you, there's there's a Trump store no, near me not. up here, uh, right over the Pennsylvania border. No, there is and, not uh, a store. Yeah, of all like flags, buttons. It's nope. an entire store. No, nope. I haven't been there. I haven't been driven past there since the election, though. So I, I'd be curious. Part of me, what I wanted to do is I wanted to go to the Trump store with a camera crew, up. hopefully, huh? With a camera Sorry. crew, hopefully. Oh, <laughs> maybe. But I just wanted to inconvenience them. I wanted to go to the Trump store, just gather up, like you know, wait, do you have this and else extra large? Or maybe I'll go for a large. Like make them go back into the sh- in the stock room a thousand times. Just pile up a bunch of crap on the counter, just thousands of dollars worth of merchandise, and then be like, oh, I gotta get my wallet. It's in the car, and then just leave. Just they have to put it all away again. That guy from the Chappelle Show just ripped me off. <laughs> they don't know Chappelle Show. Christian Finnegan, everybody, as always, so appreciate your time. Love talking to you. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks, Pete. Oh, yeah. He's a stand up favorite. Christian Finnegan on Twitter at Christ Finnegan. Check him out online. Buy his albums. Watch him do stand up virtually in person if you get the opportunity. Always a great, solid guest. So smart, thoughtful, funny. Love him. And now it's time to get to another good friend of mine who's also a comedian. Two comedians on one show. Well, I don't know. That's just how it worked out this week. But I really wanted to help uh, Joe promote his gig this weekend, Valentine's Day at the Stress Factory, and his new project podcast from Pretender to Contender, which you can get on YouTube. Get all the links at JoeMatterese.com, JoeMatterese.com, and follow him on Twitter and Instagram. Joe is one of the best comedians of my time. I came up just behind him. I began my career opening for him. He's really generous to me at that point, uh, and and it was uh, very not something that happened, and I'll never, ever be able to thank him enough for that. He's been on Letterman. He's been on Craig Ferguson, the Howard Stern Show, America's Got Talent. He's one of the most respected comedians in the New York, well, really the national comedy scene, and... Joe is uh, one of my oldest friends, and his wife is a dear friend of mine. We spent a lot of time together, and I I thought I'd have a conversation with him about how much I've seen him grow uh, over our time together as friends. I mean, Joe has done it all. He's gone to therapy. He has had all of the hard conversations with his family and friends and fans. He has uh, tried different medications, and he's he's a great father. He's a great husband and a great friend. And here's my conversation that I think you're really going to like with Joe Matteris. Joe Matteris, everybody. Joe Matteris. Hi. Hi, Pete sometimes weird to interview someone that you know so well and that you're so close with. Do you agree with that? I mean, most of the people that you interview and talk to, you know, pretty well, but not always. Right. Uh, yeah, I would say it's very rare in the, in the, uh, in show business that you're getting interviewed by somebody that you like know and your wives or friends and all that. And our kids know each other. Yeah. That, that's like how often that you're the only one, I think. Well, for me, I wanted to make it an interview and less of a conversation because you and I can have a conversation and we could record it and it could be funny about anything. You and I can talk about anything because we are such close friends. But I wanted to because I think you sharing your story, as you always have so honestly in your work and your stand up and your podcasts and TV, everything you've done is inspiring, motivating and helpful. So I wanted to talk about the kind of what I would call your maturity as a man, your emotional growth about yours cool okay do you want to start from uh oh i'll let you go i do i I want to start i want to start from your childhood (laughs) because i think your relationship with your dad and the type of family that you grew up in and how you've been able to look back at that and and see how it affected you and how it affects you as a husband and a father i think all that's interesting so tell me about growing up in cherry hill new jersey as the oldest of three 
Uh, well, let's see. Let's see how, how early you want to go. Do you want to know where I... The where embryo. I, uh, I want to go to conception. Where were you conceived by your parents? I'm, I'm not exactly sure where I was conceived, but I, I did live in uh, Upper Darby, Pennsylvania, which a lot of people don't know until I was about four, probably about to be old enough to go to kindergarten. And then uh, we moved from Upper Darby, PA to Cherry Hill, New Jersey, um, when we lived in Upper Darby, PA, we lived right around the block. Or no, what do I say around the block? We lived across the street from my mother's mother. Oh. And, th- and then we moved to Cherry Hill, New Jersey, two doors away from my mother's mother. So my mother's mo- <laughs> my grandma moved to Cherry Hill first and we moved like a year later. And boom, we're right. We're right next to them again. I- Both your parents are Italian, right? Yes. And what I mean, we can. We, you have a ton of jokes and material about specifically about your family and about that ethnic background and so on. But it, it, a lot of it's generalities and stereotypes. Yet, nonetheless, how do you think like their culture, their background, their their Italian, you know, how they identify with with that affected you or your family? What does it make you as Italians? Are they first generation? No, they're. No, they're not. My neither of my grandparents uh, lived in Italy, but they're so. I guess that makes a that makes me third generation, right? No, f- fourth generation, right? You do the math. Well, third or fourth is about the same in terms of where we end up culturally. In my opinion, it's like you know now you're just Jersey Italian, whatever that is. Yeah, yeah, and it's funny because I have a clip of my stand up that went from like two thousand downloads to like 560,000 downloads in the last month. And I didn't even know I like went on my YouTube page. I'm like, Whoa, what the hell happened what, here? What How does it? that explode? And it's, it's titled Italy Italians versus American Italians. That's right. I know that and, bad. Yeah, and there's so many people arguing in the comments that are like living in Italy that said, we don't even look at Italian Americans as Italians. We just look at you as Americans. Like we're Italians over here. Well, they do and, and they American. don't. And as you know, I can speak to that. And I didn't want to make it about me. But when you go to Italy, like Val's family is there, they, they that's true. They don't necessarily consider you Italian, except for the part where if you have like 5% blood, that's how they get you any credibility with the family like yeah this is pete it's val's girlfriend his grandmother is sicilian they're like oh well then you're in but they don't really respect you as an italian yet that's the credibility that you have when you're there but how did it affect like is there anything there to talk about do you think with like your childhood like what kind of like your parents ethnically or religiously catholic any of that i mean i i think i know where you're trying to leave me because you know i I feel like you might you don't don't know these answers you don't even know the answers. Well, I mean, very, very Catholic. My Both my parents went to private Catholic school from kindergarten all the way through high school. Um, always church going. My mom and dad are very religious still to this day. You know, never, never stopped. Always um, go to church at least once a week. And how my did dad- that what was that? What was, how did that affect you growing up? Like, how does the Catholicism, how do you see it affecting them? How do you see it affecting you on anything, their views, the way they treat folks? Well, the older I got, it's like interesting how, when you get older, you start to realize why you did certain things in your life from where you chose to grow up when you got the choice in your adult life and why your friends changed and you never realize it when you're younger, right? It just happens. And then as you get older, you're like, I must have subliminally did that. Like everybody I grew up with, they all still live in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. All the guys that I was friends with in high school, they're all still there except for one. Only one of them. And he's a, when I think about it, he's a little bit more like me. He was, and he moved to Nashville at one point. He wanted to be a singer songwriter and, uh, and he gave it about 10 years. He met his wife who he's married to still. And then he was like, fuck this and left and, you know, got a regular job and then went on with his life. He was, and he lives in Maryland now. So, um, all my sister, my brother, they're all still in Cherry Hill and they're more probably religious than me. Whereas I'm not religious at all anymore. 
Um, even our kids don't go to Sunday school. They're not making their sacraments. I made all my sacraments. My son was going to Sunday school up until he got his first Holy communion. And then we just kind of, we just kind of bailed on it. And I can't even tell you why we bailed on it, except it just felt like there was no, didn't feel connected to it anymore. Even though my parents did not agree with that, but they didn't like shun me. They weren't like, you know, in some religions where if one of the, their kids decides they don't want to, you know, well, practice the, that religion. They're like, what, what do you like? It's a huge, like, I they're think like people, okay, whatever. I think people, our generation make it sometimes make a choice to send their kids to Sunday school, to go to church, just to not have a problem with their still believing parents. And then some of us say, sure. screw that. I'm doing my thing. And, you know, and that's part of how generationally and religiously, I guess we get watered down. But the point is your parents, it didn't create too much of an issue or. It did at first and it like, didn't what did happen. They say? Until- like, what was that conversation like? What is that like? How do you handle it? I mean, my brother still will say things every once in a while because like my son just got accepted into Jesuit private high school that will be starting next year. and he'll, he'll be going to Fordham prep and my brother won't know what that means exactly means and it'll be like do they know that he didn't get his confirmation wasn't that going to be a problem like what if he you know wants to get married later in a church and now he doesn't have those sacraments he won't be able to get married in a church and we're like so like i mean i guess that's what's odd about religion is you end up being what your parents are and then you might evolve later You know what I mean? Like my kids aren't practicing religion because we aren't like if we were now, my son's going to have religion in in his high school when he starts at Fordham prep, that's going to be the, you know, he has, that's not why that's not why you're sending him there. It's because of the education. Yeah. Well, look look at it this way and and then, and then answer me how, how you think about it, but you're talking about what your parents religiosity and how they used it in your upbringing and your siblings upbringing. And how you're not necessarily applying that. But what if there is a metaphor like, you know, a a suit with all the accessories and and your parents put all this stuff on you. Our parents put all these things on us with well-intentioned, but whatever it is from the religious stuff to all the other stuff that you've so honestly talked about in your stand up at about your relationship with your parents and your anger and your all of the emotions that come from it. Like, don't you think that as a parent you don't want to put necessarily, or you want to put different stuff on your son and daughter, give them a different suit. If you will, if I stick with this, this metaphor, is that a a way of thinking what they put on us and what we take off of us and what we might keep? Well, like I'm, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. Um, I think what I'm putting on my kids and I don't know if this would be putting something on them is, I figured out who I am. You got to figure out who you are and whatever you choose is fine with me. You know, like it's your choice, but I'm letting you know with them becoming Jewish, whatever they want to be. I could really care less. I'm serious. Like (laughs) I know, but you're supposed to say, no, that's where I draw the line. I feel every time I've ever visited anything that was connected to Judaism, whether I went to watch somebody, um, get their, uh, our mitzvah or bat mitzvah, which I went to see a boy and girl, they were twins. And I would, and, or I've gone to like, I've gone to shivas. Mm -hmm. I've gone to uh, when a Jewish person passed away, the funeral for it. And I feel so much more connected to Judaism makes way more sense to me. I'm the same way I grew up Catholic. And then I was introduced to Judaism through friends and the cultures and the, a lot of it. I, I completely agree with you. So let me just, so, so you have, grown so much i've watched you we've known each other for so long and i've watched you grown grow so much in in every possible way married a wonderful woman who's one of the most exceptional human beings i've ever met it's quite a mismatch i kid when you make that joke the i you always realize that like the the other person gets insulted and so i feel bad stuff sorry joe's a great guy and that's why i'm 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 friends with you and talking with you because i thought i think your growth is so inspiring, as I said earlier. How do you look at where that kind of began? When you started asking questions about who you were and who you wanted to be, and then 
the issues that you psychologically were dealing with that had never been diagnosed. <laughs> Can you edit and re-ask me that whole? It felt like you just, just asked me like four questions. And you, you did. Know, I was uh, terrible. I was rambling and trying. I to... suffer from uh, attention deficit no, I disorder. I saw your so eyes you dart away. Three questions. I start to roll backwards. So, so, ahead. so what do you really want to know? I asked what I want to know, but not very well. When did you start deciding that you wanted to make changes and address some of the issues that you felt that you were dealing with? When did you identify those issues and say, you know what, There's, I got to do some work here? Um, we that, that, all start, that all started when I was just dating my wife, when we were engaged and we were having difficulties, which I always thought growing up that you wouldn't have difficulties during the engagement. but we did. And I would say <laughs> that we are a better husband and wife than we were as an engaged couple, which is which most people would probably say the opposite. No, that's that's the that's the involving. that's the growth that I'm talking about. That's what I've seen. Yeah. Like that's most people can't say that. You, the, and I, the fact that you say that and acknowledge that is so great. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, we were we struggled to the point where my wife doesn't even really like looking at like pictures from our wedding like we don't even have them in we don't even have our an our wedding album and we paid three thousand dollars to this amazing photographer take all these awesome candid artistic photos and they've never been printed or put in a book they're literally still on a disc and i think it's because we weren't at a great place even when we got married uh, we were feeling off on our honeymoon i remember it my wife will tell you if you asked her if she was here she would say i enjoyed the week because we took a week in between our wedding and our honeymoon mm -hmm. she enjoyed that week better than the <laughs> than the uh, wedding or the honeymoon she loved that week you should make that um, wedding album finally and just put a big label triggered and then give it to her I've always wanted to get it professionally done and surprise her with it, but she probably wouldn't even enjoy it because she knows. Yeah. What was it? Where what we happened? were mentally back What then. changed? What was it? A ton changed. Well, I mean, when we were dating, my anger problems were really bad. I was just, just going off the hook a lot in my job as a comedian, a lot getting in trouble as you used to call it, jekylling, that I would jekyll. I'd go from this nice guy to just really angry, very similar to my father growing up. I had a dad that is the sweetest man ever and has this whole other gear that you're like, what the fuck just happened? And I've, I, I've seen it even now as an adult where he'll snap on one of my kids if they misbehave when they're at his house. And I'm just like, oh, shit, that's that thing he did when we were young. I hate that. Why are you scary? Uh, so, my, my, yeah, my wife was witnessing a lot of that. And as a psychologist, two things happened. One, she suggested therapy a few times. And I didn't really, if these two things didn't come together, I probably would have never started doing therapy. I remember another comedian that I valued his growth. And there was something in the way he described it where he had given me a therapist phone number and said, this guy's amazing. He's like a second father to me. He's not about the money. He, I pay this guy with CDs. Sometimes I know he likes jazz and I'll give him a, a jazz CD because I don't have any money and he'll, he'll accept it. And wow. um, so meeting a guy that suggested the right therapist and having a wife and that's suggesting it, it was was huge and also what was huge and i i'm writing a play right now where this there's a mo this moment is in the play where i say to the audience i i didn't want to i didn't want to let her down she actually said i'm not i'm not going to not want to be with you because of your anger but you're not fun to be with this isn't fun and when she said this isn't fun it really hit me and i was like I don't want, I'm a pleaser, like from sexually to mentally, like I love making somebody feel good. Like when I see something funny and I want, I want to share it. I'm, I want to show nine people this video that I found on YouTube. You know, this is hilarious. Or if I see a movie that really moved me, I want to tell a lot of people about it.
you know no you're a plea i know what you're i know what you're saying and i can relate to that i think i i, I share yeah. that quality to some extent so what what changed so what changed so you started going to that therapist so i said let's let's go with this let's try therapy first i wasn't i was never against it and my parents were like they thought i was nuts well the devil is uh, in the therapy and i even and i even remember early on your listeners will probably never have met a therapist that did this or maybe they have but the therapist said can you bring your parents in oh bring them to a session and i was like oh my god how am i going to get them to come and that very early on working with that therapist he knew how to get you to ask for things in a way that you could get what you wanted in life he would say don't get mad at him say it would really be it's really important to me or um i feel like something's missing in my life and i'm upset and it would really help if you guys could come to therapy with me it could solve a lot of questions so he knew how to um he taught me how to rephrase things in a way to get what you wanted, but in a really n- loving way, instead of a, this is what I want. Why won't you come to therapy with me? That's never going to work. Did they but go? Like, Did you I do love it? You got, they came and my mom was, I couldn't even believe that she came and, and, and we're talking the two hour drive into New York city from South Jersey. That's huge for, you know, Italian Americans <laughs> to do. They had never been to therapy in their life. Okay. So, um, my dad was a lot better in the session than my mom. My mom was a little defensive because the therapist like had a lot of thoughts on me and from ADD and a learning disability and that, you know, them always calling me lazy growing up, you know, it was that old school Italian American, household where it was like you know they did not agree with medications my mom i mean you know the stand-up bit or it's a true story i called her and said i'm taking antidepressants and she said why don't you just take a long walk and eat a meatball sandwich (laughs) like have a nice lunch (laughs) well there is there is truth to that you know being in nature and you know there there's something there but i don't think that that was the uh no necessarily uh, not when you have some sort of chemical imbalance right. which i don't realize right away i go i'm going to therapy a long time before i even delve into medications for my problems so i start working with this guy and one thing i don't even know what you know this but you probably know it that really was a night and day like light switch of changing my life and changing my relationship with my father i didn't even realize that the therapist said something like uh does he does your dad tell you that he loves you and i said well no and he goes hat does has he ever and i said no he's never said that to me you know and i'm in my 40s and when i'm starting therapy and uh i'm he goes would you like him to Would you like him to say that? I go, yeah, I guess I would. And he's like, tell him, tell him. I go, and this is where I didn't know how to talk yet. And he's, he, uh, this is early therapy. I didn't know how to get that to happen. And he's like, tell him like what I just said to you. It, it upsets you and you, you'd like to hear it. And, uh, I, I went, I literally, uh, and I am a guy that likes to evolve I didn't even take time. I called him in my car as soon as I got out of therapy. I went in. I think I stayed parked. I called him from the parked car. I told him it was two things because there was another incident when I was younger where my dad flared up with his anger and got mad at me because I cursed out my mom and I ran out the front door and he tried to stop me and he accidentally broke my ankle because he tried to stop me and he he grabbed me hard and his weight fell on me and my ankle went out and I broke my ankle and that came up in the same therapy session. Would you like him to say, I love you. And do you want him to say he's sorry? And I said, both of those things. Yes. So I brought up the leg breaking. You called, you go outside in the car and you called him up, call him up right away. And he was like, my dad's very much like me. Like, emotional guy he's he's into evolving he's always said to me from an early age uh 
we never we never stop we never stop changing we always you know we change we evolve mm. you change as you get older mm. and um he said oh my god i never apologized and i said no and he goes oh my god i'm sorry i'm so sorry and he a whole other side of my dad came out which was your mom and i were having a tough time back then when you were a teenager her and I weren't getting along. He, all this stuff came out that I never knew. He became my friend, not my dad. It was odd. I had never really heard him being this way. He's like, it was tough. And I, I got it because I'm a married guy now, you know. Sure. I sure. get it. Yeah. Oh, you're having a tough time. Yeah. I can imagine having a teenager who just said, fuck you to his wife right in her face, which I did. I said, fuck you, mom. My mom was being very negative. She's telling me something and I used to just always lose it on her said fuck you and i'm and i walked out the front door and and he got mad and blah 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 blah. so he apologized for that and i go and one other thing (laughs) like you never have said i love you to me and he goes i didn't i didn't know you needed to hear that and that's Mm -hmm. when i found out from the conversation that he had never heard it from his dad he goes Mm -hmm. my dad never said he loved me and i just knew he did and i didn't need to hear it I got it. And I go, Oh, well, I guess I would like, you know, to hear it sometimes and have you mean it and say it to me. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering if that, uh, at first I thought maybe that was connected to the anger problems. Like there was this like lack of love in my mind so that I was reaching. And uh, so ever since then, he's been super affectionate with me says, I love you constantly now every time we hang up the phone or when we see each other he gives me like a kiss on the face he's way more emotional with me than he is with i'd say my sister or my brother and he's even admitted to me recently that he has a better probably a closer relationship with me than he does with my brother and my brother just uh, tunes out like he does my brother's not this emotional guy right, my brother's right. more of like a guy's guy right you know right. he goes we could talk for five minutes he goes i can he goes you and i are similar we could talk for hours he goes we have a we have good conversations he said that to me recently i said yeah i think we do so that changed uh, a lot in in therapy but um how, how long did you go to therapy before and what changed when you started taking different medications? Well, on a side note, it's pretty interesting that I'm having this conversation with you in a podcast format because recently, and this almost tell you, it's like, we're going to give away the end of the podcast and I probably shouldn't, but my therapist recently said, I don't think you even need to come anymore. He goes, uh, how about we just do an as needed he goes, every time we, he first, he brought, broke it down to once every two weeks for probably about the last six or seven months. And just two weeks ago, he's like, how about just as needed? Cause there's just, there was getting to the point where there's nothing to talk about. There was like nothing going wrong. I was just handling things very well. And I was almost reaching for problems when I was in his office. That's really very fascinating that you got to that point and that he recognized that and didn't try to keep taking your money. Cause that's certainly a legitimate knock on, on therapists that they they'll bilk you no matter what the deal is. So that's great. That's so, you know, we, we, but that's okay that you told us the ending. G- but that back wasn't the, what was the exact question about you just medication asked? when you were diagnosed and where that came from and what uh, your, what your, you have, you've had a real journey and a very honest, transparent journey about anxiety, depression, and using med- different medications, different doses, all of it. It's everybody should yeah, look up. And, and if you have any ever dealt with any of this, you know anything about it, watch Joe stand up because he trivializes it in a way or he talks about it in a way which makes it hilarious. And so <laughs> honestly and openly so. Yeah. And I even, I even started doing these mental health comedy shows again with my cousin, Matt, who's a, also a neuropsychologist and he's kind of the doctor and we have different comedians mixed the great in. Matt Ballas. Just, love, love Matt. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Matt, Matt, Matt's awesome. So, uh, hates weed. Yes, he hates weed. I gotta he, get him on this. <laughs> I gotta get him on this podcast, actually. He's such a he, great he, guy. He, One of the greatest guys. And then at some point yeah. I'll argue with him about weed, which is 
<laughs> that's good for well, radio. He's a, he's a he's a drug and alcohol like educator, and so and yeah. I respect him. Well, he, he talks work. more about mental health now. Yeah, yeah. During cor- cor- Corona, he kind of switched his uh, his topic. Anyway, so but, you started um, that back up so, with Matt, which is cool. But but just talk to me about the uh, yeah. So I go to therapy for about I'd say about ten years, at least probably ten years before I start taking any medications. Um, basically nothing's it gets to a point where some stuff is being fixed. Like my relationship with my mom and dad is better. My relationship with, um, my wife is better, but it's not, it's not as good as probably I knew it could be because the anger outbursts are still there. And they're happening. Now all of a sudden they start happening a lot at my job where I get fired from doing stand up like two different times. I, I, I get fired and I got kids now. I can't get fired from comedy. I'm like, Oh my God, mm. I can't have this. Um, and I'm, there was one major outburst in front of my wife's mom's house where I'm trying to, my car runs out of gas. I'm trying to pour the gas can like that nozzle thing. And I can't get the nozzle. I must've like not had the right size nozzle for like the, yeah. the gas hole in this car we had and gas is going down the side of the car and getting all over the paint of the car. And I'm yelling motherfucker at the, I'm telling you top of my lungs. Yeah. Like when I would have an anger outburst, like yeah. if I got mad and would like leave a room and I was mad, I would slam the door like, I'm taking this fucker off the hinges. Like that's how angry I would get at nothing. So I scream motherfucker so loud. And she comes over and whispers in my ear, what are you doing? Like my mom lives here. I grew up on this street. I knew, I know everybody very well that lives around here. You can't do that here. You have a problem. You need to get on some sort of medication uh, once again, she goes, I'm not saying I'm going to leave you, but this is, this isn't fun. This is, she not said that good, while she was criticizing you. I'm not saying I'm yeah, going to leave you. Yeah. She's, uh, she said that at one point. Yeah. I remember like, I'm not having fun. You need to, you need just try, maybe just try them. She's like, I'm not saying you need to go on them and be on them, but you know, like I do this for a living. I'm a psychologist. I know what I'm talking about. There's something wrong. You need to, try to fix it, give it a shot. And, uh, I do once again. And thanks. So this happened recently. No, no, no. I've been on antidepressants for 10 years. This incident in your wife's mother's neighborhood was the catalyst for you getting on a drug. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cause you said you had gotten fired from jobs. I thought you were talking about recently. No, no, no. I haven't known. I haven't I'm gotten sorry. Forgive me. I just, was, I, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to clear that up. So, yeah. So that was the incident. That was the, the breaking point. And, and then what happened? What did you, what did you like do? I said, I lose the gigs and that happens mm-hmm. all in one Got it. time frame. I, uh, and then, um, I start a podcast called fixing Joe. Cause that's the, I'm the king of taking my negatives and turn them into art an artistic expression yes. in some. Yes. You've done your whole career. Yeah. It's been just profoundly impressive to watch and, and always yeah. hilarious. So I, and, I, yeah. So I start a podcast where the audience is the doctor and I'm honest about my issue each week, whatever's going on in my life. And they would, they would call and leave voicemails or email me with all their thoughts. And then I would go and do an episode. It's probably one of the best things I've ever done, but it ran its course when I started to get better and people still give me shit. You should still be doing it. I'm like, I evolve, man. Well, when that's I a get, huge problem evolve, for a lot of comedians is staying in their shit so they can still draw from the shit that you never want to leave it. Cause that's where all of your content comes from, but that limits you in every way and makes you a miserable, horrible, toxic person to be around. And, and so you made the, the hard choice, but the, the right choice to, to, to try to get better and uh, not to have that uh, be your, you know, your source of, yeah. of constant material. Your well, misery. Once again, once again, finding the right therapist, who's like your, 
not just your therapist, like your mentor for your career. Mm -hmm. Everything about you is, is something he's helping you with. Like he's not just helping you with your marriage. Like this guy's helping me with money decisions, job choices, like everything that I'm not sure about. And now like why I'm not seeing him anymore is I'm able to make my own choices. Now I, I never knew how to make decisions. I would be like, stuck i would be like should i do that? i was always asking that's what fixing joe was and that's why i stopped doing it because i was like no wonder i'm not evolving and i'm staying screwed up i'm asking everybody to tell me what to do that's not good that's not good for a person that's not a strong stance to be insecure about everything and you know what helped me realize that is i heard another comedian getting interviewed on mark maron's podcast mm -hmm. That we know, I don't want to say his name, but he sounded so pathetic and so neurotic that he couldn't make decisions. And he was so like wounded and so pathetic that I was like, ew, I'm that. What, fixing Joe is such an insecure stance. I hate this. I'm done. And I just said, done with fixing Joe. Uh, and let's go try medication. Because my wife says what when she said, just try it. I was like, well, what do I got to lose? I'll just try it. You Can know? I just and ask I, you a question that relates to all of this, um, which is and I think you'll, I, I'm really interested to hear what you'll you'll say about this. I don't think we've ever really talked about this in depth. We've just, I think, modeled it both you and I. But what role does kind of like your manhood, your masculinity, your your gender play in your life? Because you're raising both. Uh, a boy, a son and a daughter and to be a man and a woman. And I wonder, you know, being this Jersey Italian guy um, and being, you know, a very heterosexual guy, women always loved you, always have. I mean, what what role does any of that play in you? Because don't don't you think I mean, I think it's a huge problem, all that stuff, that masculinity and this this toughness we're supposed to have for ourselves, much less raising our sons or, or role modeling for our daughters. And I wonder how much you think about that like what kind of man are you joe well i mean something that um is huge is and and why a lot of people run into problems in life is what your parents are like you're such a reflection of them it's ridiculous and i know that i'm or you this can guy. be you, you can you you certainly are very vulnerable to being a reflection of them just so yes. people know yes. that there is you know you can know obviously a lot of people try to be the opposite but go ahead yeah yeah for sure i think i'm a version of huge version of my father and and that i and then i try to improve upon it right so I think the reason why I'm not this overly masculine guy is my, my dad's not. And the guys that I know, usually the guys that I'm friends with, they're not that way either. Like I'm not, I never am friends with those like overly masculine people. I'm probably like the, your most masculine friend, right? But you're not though. Like you always told you, you're kidding, right? I was going to say you're masculine in ways no, don't you talk know, about me. I'm, we can. One I'm day we can do a whole thing where you you analyze me and I'd be happy to do it. But so, yeah. Yeah. No, but my dad is a sensitive guy. You know, I've right. seen him, you know, I've seen him watch movies that catch him, you know, and he's like, he's not, he's not a guy's guy at all. So how are you Even raising? He can be. How are you raising Luke with, with all of that in mind in terms of talking about that because it's your environment that puts it upon you right all these expect expectations of what kind of boy you are and and sports and girls and toughness and and that you can't like these kinds of things or wear those kinds of things I and mean, how do you how do you deal with that with him does it come up and i'm very in check my wife will catch me once in a while slip something in where she'll go. You just sounded like your mom or you just sounded like your dad, you know, like don't do that to Luke, but it, on a, a not 90% of the time and it doesn't happen. And I'm very aware of like, you know, like my son's got hair down to here right now and wears pink shirts, you know, and, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I'm never, I, I care less. Like, 
You know what I mean about masculinity? I just care about him being a caring, good person. And when he answers questions, like recently, like one of his friends uh, had a girlfriend that he dated for. My son's only 13, but one of his friends was dating this girl for like eight months as a 13 year old. And it's one of his best friends. And he's friend. My son was friends with the girl and the girl and his friend broke up. And you could tell that the girl was kind of liking our son. And we said something to him and he goes, I could never do that. Not to, not to my friend. And, you know, I just could never do that. And I was like amazed that he even said that at 13, at 13, that he could say that. I was like, oh, wow. Like at me at 13, I would have thrown my friend under the bus. Well, maybe he's more into his friend than he is the girl. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then he's also said something where some of them I always explain to him, like nice girls are better than like a girl you want. It, and he'll go dead. We all all my friends, we only like nice. We like the nicer ones we get like the, he's so like, I feel, so like, he's, you, he's I feel like the audience heard me suggest uh, something about your son's sexuality. But you didn't hear me when I said maybe he likes what? the guy friend more than the girl. Oh, is that what you meant? No, no, no. no he, I doesn't. Don't, it, he doesn't. I, I don't think, like, I know that you don't care about any of that stuff. And I think that your answer to all of it just now w- was great. And for the sake of time, um, I just want to ask you, I don't know if you can make this quick, but I got to go, speaking of which, parent, got to take Ava out. But um, can you talk a little bit about, just a little bit about what drugs you've used and what medications you've used and how they've worked or haven't worked is just a little bit about your experience. I'd love to get into it in detail, uh, but okay. just your journey with medication is really the, the question I'm asking. Let's see, let's see if I can take you through that fast. So, I mean, the, the antidepressant that I start taking is Celexa. And to be honest, it's only changed once and then changed right back again. Like I started, I think on 10 milligrams and like for a really long amount of time. And I'm talking like, four years maybe um i'm on 10 and then i think maybe i should try 20 and then i try 20 and i don't remember how long i was on it but i was like i want to i want to go back down the 10 and this is what people struggle with to take antidepressants a lot because especially if you're a creative person you start to feel your creativity has gone away Mm -hmm. you don't have this angst this anger was I mean, if I if I listen to old audio or video of me when I was this angry guy, even though I'm getting fired, I start listening to what I was saying and it makes me laugh out loud. I'm like, how did you come up with that? That was the most clever, mean thing that you just said. It's hilarious. Right. But it would still get me in trouble because I couldn't stop. It would keep being angry. It would just be too long. It wasn't like da 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 da, and then go back to being a fun comedian again. It was like bah, 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 da, 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 and they're like, "What the hell, dude? Stop!" I used to compare it to um, Matt Damon in Goodwill Hunting, where he's punching the kid on the ground and he doesn't stop. He's going to kill the guy, and they have to pull him off, and that's why he's got to go to jail, you know, yeah. or or juvie. That was me as a, as an angry man. It was yeah. just angry, angry, and it just didn't stop until you you shut the microphone off in the club. Or yeah, I just, witnessed that a couple times yeah, with you. Yeah, was, you witnessed it. So I so I thought it, it was stunting the creativity a little bit. So I wanted to go back down to the ten milligrams. <laughs> so funny. This is how I knew. I always say I know it's not enough in my system and there's some sort of weird anger anxiety chemical imbalance as soon as i lowered the milligrams whenever my wife would just say my name from in the house like she needed me for a second like joe like that's it i couldn't not go what like it was just this angry what no matter what and she could be like (laughs) asking me to come down and try a chocolate chip cookie (laughs) do you want to have sex (laughs) you want to have sex right now what so she goes, I, she would say it too. She go, you, you need to go back up to the 20 milligrams. You're yelling at nothing again. And I was like, <laughs> you're right. You're right. I need to accept that. Okay. Maybe there's a little less angst and there's a little less funny to write about, but being in a good mood is, and, and, and being in control of myself is so much more important 
So I figured that out pretty fast. And I, I've never been one of those guys. that's like, I'm going to go down the no medication. Like I, I was like, I know in my head, I, that, I'm a horrendous version of myself with no medication. You could send me to therapy every day of the week. It wouldn't matter. Like there's something wrong in here that makes me not how to handle. So you've stayed how to handle a negative situation. You stayed on uh, medication for depression at different dosages for uh, years. Still to this day, it's been like 12 years. Like I said, I've only gone 10 to 20, back to 10. But only has it only been. one medication or has it been different medications and has it only been to treat depression or was there uh, attention and anxiety stuff like well there's a uh, i get diagnosed with an add and start taking add meds way after that but selexa was the only med i was ever on and ever switched i just switched milligrams from 10 to 20 Mm -hmm. back to 10 and then back to 20 again that's all i've ever messed with it you know, I've never taken anything else. And then um, my wife suggested trying Adderall. And but, I, you know, then I had to get diagnosed. You can't you can get an antidepressant from your like regular doctor, which made it really easy. Just go to him. I have anxiety. I would have full on anxiety attacks too. It wasn't like I was just angry. Like I would have those full blown, like sweating Tony Soprano anxiety attacks. Mm. And I haven't had one since I've been on Selexa and they were horrendous. I'd be on so stage. Just to be clear I'd, though, oh, that, that that can be confusing. You're taking Selexa for as an antidepressant, right? But it helps you, but it also helps you not have anxiety attacks. So I always aren't there drugs. I was never depressed. I've never been a guy that was like, oh, my God, I want to commit suicide or I want to lay in bed all day. Not I want to eat and just be a loser. Never a depressed person. I could get sad sometimes and just maybe not be. So then why an antidepressant? Well, some people that have strong anxiety will go the route where they'll take like uh, you hear people saying they'll take what's Klonopin or uh, Xanax. Right? Yeah, I, I know. It. I'm most familiar with Xanax. I hear most about that. I, t- I tried that at first and that didn't work well for a comedian because I would take Xanax because I used to have a real the anxiety would go crazy. You've been on an airplane with me. I would lose. I would get so afraid on an airplane. I every airplane ride felt like I was going to die. You yelled fly straighter. Yelled it. <laughs> I was like, I don't even think that's I don't think that's even a thing you can Steer. see. I think I said, why is he steering? Well, something about steering. Straighten it. <laughs> so uh, I would take um xanax for airplane rides but then when i would land and have to go do my job i physically couldn't my brain was like mush i just i was not crisp i was tired very lethargic and i was like this isn't work and then when i i had a few friends that were taking an antidepressant for anxiety attacks and one person i knew very well there was something about him being on it for what i his symptoms, what he was struggling from matched up with mine perfectly. I was like, okay, I'm going to try this. And now you're just on it. Your brain transforms. It's different. You know that. I mean, Xanax is you take it in 10 minutes. It's working. I don't know that. I've never, I, I took a, like, oh, you half, never did it? I took like Dude. A half a pill once and I, and it helped me sleep. And then it's the only time I ever did it, it was last year after I lost my job. But it takes yeah. all the panic out of your brain, yeah, just like drinking yeah. alcohol does. Yeah. Like if I'm on a, on a plane and it's in bad turbulence, if I drink two or three uh, bourbons, I don't worry about bouncing around so much. When I would take Xanax before I was on any sort of antidepressant and I was freaking out in a cold sweat on an airplane, if I could take Xanax and be in black clouds and sleeping. Like it just made me, it it made my, you don't feel high on it. You could be going down. The plane could be worried. Lose a, it it could lose a wing and you'd be like, Hey, you know, I'm sure it'll be fine. It'll be good. We, I've seen (laughs) these planes can fly with one wing. You like start to think like (laughs) ridiculously positive. (laughs) Well, that's, that sounds, it seems like a pretty good effect. 
it, it was, but it, it, I pro- and but the, here's the net. It, it can be very addicting. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. it's way worse for your liver to be taken. That's like taking like a, a major narcotic yeah, every as, day as to, needed and wrong. only in real maybe crisis situations when you're having problems. All right. Well, listen, I got I I got to run, but I and I hate to because I want to ask you more questions. So let's do part two. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of reaction. (laughs) Well, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of reaction to this conversation when people who have had similar journeys, issues, dealt with them in similar ways or haven't. And so I'm I'm looking forward to maybe. So if people have questions or comments, send them to me, and and Joe and I will discuss them, or maybe Joe will you know join a a breakout group with some listeners and subscribers at some point. Uh, My email, of course, stand up with Pete at gmail dot com, and um, the gig that you are promoting because this is going to post on Friday. I'll have it in the show notes, but what do we want to tell people to do? This Sunday at the uh, Stress Factory in New Brunswick, I'm doing two shows on Valentine's Day. They're both sold out because they're socially distanced. They can only do 150 people in this heated tent that um, this guy who owns the club built on to his comedy club during Mm -hmm. Corona. And he's got like a pimped out tent, but um, they're sold out. So he's able to stream one of the shows live as it's happening right to youtube in high definition awesome. and uh with mul- with multiple cameras and we're s- they're selling a ticket to the eight o'clock virtual show so you could live anywhere and watch it live um and, and they just have to go to stressfactory.com to buy the ticket for the 8 p.m virtual streaming version of my show that'll be a the fun. whole show too there's gonna probably be two openers in front of me you'll have the whole show you could sit at home and drink you don't have to worry about driving and drinking valentine's day home. will there be a lot of uh, love and marriage romance material yes there'll be a lot of uh, relationship material great so people are, right. are in relationships <laughs> uh who are celebrated or not celebrating valentine's day thank you very much your honesty is always you're a great friend and you're an inspiration to watch and uh, I've, I've learned a lot from watching you thank you uh, i appreciate i appreciate you having me on pete all right, Joe Matteris, check him out this Sunday at the Stress Factory online and also JoeMatteris.com. Subscribe to his YouTube channel from Pretender to Contender. He's got so much great stuff online. One of the, the best stand-up comedians of my generation and obviously a really great friend. I hope you enjoyed that. If you like that kind of conversation, then let me know because I'd like to do a lot more of those conversations about how we grow as, as, as people in our lives and, and, and what works and what doesn't. And maybe we can all learn from each other. That's the idea, at least. All right. Great week of shows. Thank you to all of my guests from this week. Yesterday, we had Michael Cohen and Hillary Cohen. Uh, Bill B. in D.C., Michael Grunwald and Pam Keith joined me the day before that. Episode 286 was climate journalist Brian Kahn and Eric Siegel. And uh, today, of course, Christian and Joe. Thank you guys very much for supporting me. Please support me on Patreon, patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. And subscribe to my YouTube page, which I'm trying to launch, youtube.com slash Stand Up With Pete. All of the information in the show notes. And that is it for today and this week. Thank you guys so much. I love you. You're not alone. Take it away, John Carroll. Where
had to stand up. They had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws and sins they weren't even sin. They knew that change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to know to make it clear and all we hear is a lie. Of that experiment, if you stand up, stand all right, up. we got to speak up, we got to reach up and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be toes up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe. Rise up, show up. To the voice inside And listen well and it'll tell you Not to run and hide It says stand up Stand oh, up Oh, got to stand up Oh, come on Just stand up Everybody got to stand up In the darkest hour Stand up People got the power Stand up Come on, come on, come on Come on, come on, come on And now the stand up comedy of Joe Matarese. I was just in San Diego. They had Oakland Raiders bars there, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I grew up outside of Philadelphia. I dare you to try to open a Dallas Cowboys bar in Philadelphia, okay? First day it's open, burnt to the ground. There's two guys outside going, dude, what happened? He's like, I don't know, man. The owner yelled, how about those? And then they lit him on fire. 